we haven't talked about what's happening to Gen Z. We haven't talked about what's happening to kids. You know, I talked about them before in a sort of negative way, like Gen Z shows up on campus and then all of a sudden there, there are all these problems. But, but again, I don't get angry. I'm not moralistic. We have to understand what's happening to Gen Z. So I just want to talk, if I can just talk a little Please. about that. And could you also define Gen Z? Yeah. And then please continue. So millennials are those who were born in 1982. And we used to think that it would go to maybe 2000. But it turns out that kids who were born in 1996 and later are different from those born, say, 1994 and earlier. I mean, it's a surprisingly sharp cut, equivalent to what we find with birth year 1946. You know, the post-war world really was different to grow up in. And I believe, so I'm drawing on work by Jean Twenge, but I've also added, she and I are working together, and I've added a lot. What happened is that if you were born in, say, 1990, you didn't get, you couldn't, you, know, you didn't get an iPhone until maybe around 2009 is when teenager, 10 is when teenagers started getting it. So if you're born in 1990, you didn't get an iPhone, a smartphone, until you were 20. And you didn't get on social media. You might have been on Facebook partly, but you don't live on social media until you have your own smartphone. Whereas if you're born in 1997, you are 13 in 2010 when you might get your first smartphone. And you might get on Instagram in 2012 when huge numbers did. So I believe Gen Z is defined by the fact that they got smartphones and social media during early puberty. There's a lot of research pointing to early puberty, around 11 to 13 for girls, 12 to 15 for boys. What's coming into your brain then is really important because your, your frontal cortex is, is wiring itself up. So when human beings are raised without much independence, but yes, with a phone, and they spend their childhood just interacting with a screen, and especially social media, I believe it, it messes up cortical development. The girls in particular, the rates of anxiety and depression are more than, up much more than 100% since 2010. The rate of self-harm, hospitalization for self-harm, is nearly tripled for preteen girls. So Gen Z is in big, big trouble. They're hurting, they're fragile, they're not doing well in the workplace. Managers are finding them very hard to work with. So we have a generation that's running off the rails. And this is not a moralistic thing like, oh, those kids these days. This is a compassionate thing. Like, these are our children. Like, my kids are 13 and 16. Everyone either has kids or is, you know, is, has nieces and nephews. So this is, I think, the greatest emergency we face, the greatest health emergency. I think for kids, this is much, much bigger than COVID. COVID was a big deal for old people. It wasn't a big deal for children in terms of the risk, but this is, you know, a doubling, more than doubling of suicide rates for kids since 2010. So that's what I'm working on now. What decisions have you made in your parenting that you feel have been perhaps most impactful, less typical, or the Venn diagram of those two overlapping? So the terrible mental health of Gen Z is caused by two factors. One is the vast overprotection. Kids need to practice independence, self-governance. From the time they're seven or eight, they need independence, but they don't get it anymore. You and I, when we were growing up, you're younger than me, but I presume you were allowed to roam around your neighborhood when you were Oh, I was free range. Old. Yeah, riding bikes everywhere when I was younger. I was also in a rural environment, but yeah, I was out and about very early. Yeah. So kids must have free range childhoods. They must practice independence. And they had that before the 90s. And in the 90s, things got incredibly safe. We locked up the drunk drivers. We took the perverts off the street. Crime plummets. But we freaked out about child abduction unnecessarily. So in the 90s, we stopped letting kids out. And this affects Gen Z and the late millennials. Anyway, but you asked about me. So what my wife and I did, we live in, here in New York City, in Greenwich Village. We, because we're friends with Lenore Skenazy, who wrote this fantastic book, Free Range Kids, we let our kids out to play in Washington Square Park. We sent them out on errands when they were eight, nine years old. You know, New York City was very safe back then. It's a little more dangerous now, but it was very, very safe in the 2010s. And we sent them out and we had them walk to school way, you know, a year or two before, before anyone else was doing it. So I'm very glad we did that. We also made it clear no social media, at least until high school, absolutely none in middle school. And that's been very good. When they start sixth grade, my kids tell me everyone's on Instagram. And we said, no, you, we're not going to let you do it. The one mistake I made was that when my son wanted Fortnite in sixth grade, and we said no, because video games can be addictive, 
I, but now that I've dug into the literature a lot more, now I see that, yes, a lot of boys do get in trouble from video games because they're on it so much. They're addicted to it, and it, and it, it pushes out everything else. But a couple hours a day for boys to be in a group that's battling other boys, it turns out that's actually a good thing. And my son was somewhat cut off in sixth grade. Good in what respects? How how is that assessed? Just in terms of acting as a release valve for aggression or social cohesion? Group dynamics. So the release valve idea from Freud does not end up being true. Kids don't need to blow off aggression. It's not like that. It's rather that girls and boys each need to practice their gendered behaviors. This is what play is. Play for all mammals is the way you practice in childhood the skills you'll need as an adult. And so boys and girls have very different play. Boys tend to break up into groups to compete with other groups. And multiplayer video games allow them to do that. So I'm not saying these are great. I'm saying, ideally, the kids should be out having adventures. But given that all the kids are home, they're not allowed out until they're you know, 11, 12 years old. So at least a multiplayer video game allows them to be part of a group. Now, it's not a very creative group. The rules are all set by the company. So it's not like video games are anywhere near as good as being out on their own. But they're not bad until it gets to be heavy. So that was a small mistake. Once COVID hit, we did let him get Fortnite, and then that was the only way he talked with his friends. So that was okay. The mistake, the one mistake I think we did make was we didn't, we tried a few different summer camps. We never quite found one. But if we, I wish we'd found a really good summer, and I would urge this for everybody who's a parent of young kids, from the time your kid is about eight or nine, certainly, I'd say eight, find a sleepaway camp that is pretty unstructured and unsupervised. The kids have to have a lot of independence. You know, some summer camps now are so overprotective, you can't go to the bathroom unless you have an escort. And sometimes you need two escorts, because what if one escort falls down and gets hurt? Like, it's crazy overprotective <laughs> everywhere. But if you can find a summer camp that is not crazy overprotective, send your kid there every summer. That, I think, is one of the few chances they really have to develop skills to be out in the woods. Hmm. So I, I wish we'd done that.